Sometimes it's, we take it for granted, but what a wonderful reality to know that your love never fails. But what a beautiful reality to know that you have loved us even before we were born. You're loving us in the midst of our moments that are difficult. And you will love us, Lord, in that time of eternity. We just want to say thank you. We don't deserve it, but thank you. May your love be the one leading us through this time of listening to your word. May your love transform our hearts. May your love empower us to make a difference in this world. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Am I the only one with soccer jersey <laughs> in Oasis? Guys? Okay, just saying. Anyways. And also I wanted to make a, a point. We were blessed yes, uh, last week having uh, Pastor Milton uh, preaching to us, and I was glad that you were able to hear him too. One thing I did notice, you were so quiet and polite with him, and I'm thinking, why are you guys so mischievous to me? And you know, the, mm -mm, something is wrong in there, but we're going to work on that, okay? So we are right now back to uh, Genesis. We're precisely today in our very last se uh, section of Genesis. We're going to go through the whole um, Pentateuch. But we are talking about how the focus on in the beginning, as specifically because we are looking at the books that are in the beginning of the Bible, and we're going back to basics. We have learned different characteristics of God when we are learning about the book of Genesis. First of all, we learned that God is a God of creation. What he has done is something that he has done very good. Are you aware that you are a very good creation of God? You need to be aware of that. You're a very good creation of God. Think, and I want you that to sink in your brain and allow that to be part of your, your spiritual growth. So if you are a very good creation of God, do not put trash on it. Does it make sense? Do not put trash on it. You are very good. If something is trash, if something is gonna hurt that very good creation, take it away in the name of Jesus. Also, we are part of Ezer Connecto. What does that mean? We're coming along with God in creation as a helper. It, we have a God that is a God of relationships that connects us with, it, with, each, with each other. We also have a God of covenant. What does it mean? It means that the God that we have is pursuing us, is constantly looking. It's kind of the song that we just sang. His love never fails. He's constantly loving us and looking in a way to connect with us. And today, last week, I'm sorry, we learned about how is a God of generations. He has been involved in history because it's his story. I like that point from Pastor Milton a lot. Now today, we're gonna focus also about who is the God of redemption. And we're using, as you can see, all this Minecraft stuff. I need to tell you that this time, I had a little bit of a battle with my kids because they, they told me, this is not really pure Minecraft mom because it has a lot of extra stuff that usually they don't, they don't use in Minecraft. But I told them, forgive me, but I like it. And I'm the one preaching the sermon. So, but uh, in this one, they explained to me, yeah, that there is this symbol that means wheat, right? Wheat of, of like uh, anything that is about planting. And this is also that help us to think about the topic of the very last section of the book of Genesis. And that is about uh, Joseph, the dreamer. How many of you have heard about his story before? Joseph, there is even a musical about it, and it was even translated in Mexico. There is so many things that we learn about Joseph and his beautiful um, outfit that we all remember. But when we listen to this story, I want you to think about this. You need to see through the story of Joseph how God deals with our lives. And one of the things we need to learn is that our ups and downs in life, we need to always see them through the whole story, through his story. We all going to face moments of ups and downs in our lives, but we need to learn to see those according to God's story, his story. And this is the example that we went, that we know through, through Joseph. Now you already know the story, so we're gonna kind of tell this story together. First of all, where does he come from? This is um, all the family tree, you see how difficult it was to do that? You know? The, okay. Abraham had a, a son, Isaac and Esau. And then they have a son too, Jacob. 
and he had two wives plus another two slaves, and then they have 12 sons. Very good shape, all the sons, as you can see. One of them is Joseph, okay? Now, Joseph had a very specific uh, characteristic and that God gave him, and it was the fact that he could have these dreams, more than dreams is visions. He has visions, and there is a gift of vision. And it is a gift that some people have where they can see through an image something that God is trying to explain or to say. How do I know if the vision is good or not? Because it usually will be confirmed by the scripture. It will be confirmed by the church. If it's just a weird vision, it's probably you had way too much Diet Coke the night before. So... But in this case, the dreams were, were something that God was telling to Joseph. Now, Joseph had a lot of great characteristics. He was really a man of God. But you see, also, I think he needed a little bit of discernment of how to talk to his brothers. Because here was coming, and he was looking very snob. And he was saying, hey, guys, I had this dream. And I wrote the words because these are difficult to pronounce to me. Okay, it says, I had this dream about how we were binding this Sheaves, all right, score, okay, sheaves, and we were all doing that. And then the 11 that you guys did were standing, or surrounding me, and they were bowing them to me, to the one that I had. Do you, how, how do you think the brothers felt about that? <laughs> oh, really, brother, we're so glad about that. No, they were like, what's wrong with you? Eh? Did you drink a lot of Diet Coke, as I said? And so, then the other dream was like, oh, I had this wonderful dream that all these 11 stars, hint, hint, 11 brothers, and the sun and the moon were surrounding me as a big star, and they were also worshiping me. This one is also getting to the nerves of the father. Because he says, how come are you talking about we're going to kind of come and bow down in front of you like if we're going to worship? What's wrong with you? But Jacob, the Bible says, he kept that in his heart because he was trying to figure out what is he doing. Now, this did not make him the most popular child on earth. Actually, he gained, it says the scripture, the brothers were really angry whenever they saw him. Oh, here comes our annoying brother, the dreamer, and he's wearing that beautiful coat that our dad gave just to him. Talk about favoritism. In the Bible, right? We can see even that. And I, I think, personally, I believe, if you are the favorite child, it's kind of a curse. And if you're not the favorite child, it's also a curse. Because they are comparing you with the favorite child, and then the favorite child is like, why do I need to carry this burden, right? So it's never good to have a favorite child. Each child is done beautiful in God's creation. So just don't get there. So here we have the dreamer, and we know the story. What happened is the brothers don't like him, so they are working, and one day the father uh, sends them to work somewhere else. They were not also the best brothers, by the way. They were really, mm, I would say, even lazy, because there is another part on the Bible that Jacob is saying, what are you doing sitting down? Move, do something, just move, you know, and, and help. But um, so one of those days, uh, the father uh, sends Joseph and says, go and look for your brothers. And when they, he goes and looks for the brothers, they saw him coming and they're like, oh, here comes the dreamer. What do we do with him? And they said, let's just kill him. Just think about that. Let's just kill the brother. All right, yes, let's do it. And then one intelligent brother says, no, 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 killing is a little bit too radical. Let's just throw him onto the cistern on the pit. Oh, well, that works. I'm thinking, Really, guys? This is your brother? You know, I know sometimes you want to get angry, but slap is okay, but no more than that. And, and don't do it to your brother or sister, but you know, anyway. So they ended putting him on the cistern, and it's creepy if you're reading the scripture because it says they just dumped him there and went to have lunch. Pass me the fries while the brother is there. <laughs> Give me a break. So then the other intelligent brother as they say in the Lego movie, quote unquote, you know, uh, says, oh, here comes a bunch of people who are these uh, business people. We can sell him to them, and then we get free of the guy, and we just tell our dad that he died. Intelligent, right? So they did that, and they sold him. This is a very down moment for Joseph, because think about how you feel about it. My brothers are rejecting me. Now I'm far away from my dad, and I'm going to go to a land that I have no clue. What is happening? Have you ever felt like that? Totally lonely? 
and totally disappearing from the map. And but God in his mercy says how he was God with him. And God was blessing the places where he was. And he was prospering the places where, you, where he was. I want you to think in yourself as I was calling you at the beginning. You are a very good creation of God. When you are allowing the spirit of God move in your life, it will make an impact wherever you are. It will make an impact in your job, in your school, in whatever location you are. Because it's not because of you, it's because of the blessing that comes from God to you as a person who's an instrument of God. So regardless where you are, you can say, God, I'm here to bless this place and you will make a difference. So that's what was happening with him. He was making a difference in his job to the point that Potiphar saw that and he made him like a manager of that. But the problem in the scripture says he was cute and handsome and he didn't stink in his feet. No, he didn't say about the feet, but he was cute and handsome. And the wife of Potiphar noticed that. Big problem. Because then she was trying to say, can I have a grape? Can I have another grape? And she was trying to attract him, says the scripture. And she wanted to really uh, totally pursue him. But he was faithful to God. He was tempted. He knew he can say, you know, but if I trust me, I can be here. Nobody will notice. But he decided to trust God. And because of his integrity, he said no to Potiphar's wife. And that made her angry. So because of that, what happened? He ended where? In prison. Here we go back to the pit. <laughs> He's in prison. But while he is there, it even says the scripture how he blessed that location to the point that the, the people who were in the prison trust him and allow him to have some extra freedom because of that. While he is there, he met two key people of the Pharaoh. And they knew that he had that gift of dreams and visions. So what happened is one day, the Pharaoh started having these dreams. And he was feeling anxious about it, and nobody was able to interpret those dreams. One of the dreams was about these seven cows. And it says there were seven really big cows. And then there were seven very skinny cows who came and ate the big cows, and they didn't even gain weight. What does that mean? And he couldn't find anyone to answer that until he heard from one of the guys who was in prison, you know, I remember this guy who was able to tell me what was that my dream about. And it was true. It happened when he said. So they brought him before the Pharaoh. Now you need to learn a little bit about the culture in Egypt. For a Pharaoh is the equivalent of who? God. It was a very strong position. So for him to come before him was very powerful. And what happens is when he's in front of him, he tells him, Pharaoh, I know what your dreams are about. Your dreams means seven years of prosperity and then seven years where you are going to have a famine. So what you need to start doing is prepare yourself so in that way when you have those seven years of famine, you're going to be able to be strong. Because of that, he was able, Joseph, to become the master, the, just the second in command, is that what to say in military? Oh, I got that one. I'm learning. I'm excited. Okay. So he was said, you're the second in command to be in charge of all of what is in my property. So you will be able to help us to have that time of prosperity. So he grew on that power. He was able to, to really have a moment where the things were not down, now were high. He was able to come and help not just the people of Egypt, but all the regions, says the scripture. Because of that, the people who were also in Canaan, the brothers, heard about the prosperity in Egypt. And that's where the scripture says that Jacob was looking at the children, at his children, and they were doing nothing to be able to bring food to the house. And he tells them, move, go and look for something. And he sends them to Egypt, where they found out after a long story that Joseph, the brother that they were intending something bad, now was the second in command with the, with the Pharaoh. And while a big process of trying to deal with forgiveness, and it can be an entire sermon series, just all the way how Joseph worked with them, we can see how God told them the dreams were true. And through all of this, Joseph was able to teach them about forgiveness and the power of God in the midst of all difficulties. All this story also brought them to the beautiful moment 
when Joseph was able to go back with his father. And they were able to live in Egypt during that time, receiving the blessing of the prosperity of Joseph. It's a beautiful story. But it's important to see this in context of three things. First of all, the God of redemption, we always need to remember, God will fulfill every promise. Do you hear that? God will fulfill every promise. It's part of God's nature. If God promised it, he will do it, and he has shown that to all of us. But I want you to be very careful about the promise itself. We need to remember that we are not an isolated story in the world. We are part of his story. So the promises that God fulfills to us are the promises that are part of that big story. So I want you to see that because you are part of that promise. You are part of that story. The promise was that God will be able to bless through Abraham and he will be able to bring a group of people that through them, they will bring salvation because through them, Jesus Christ came. And now us as a church proclaim that truth to others. We are part of that promise. So when we are looking for God to fulfill his promise, you need to ask that question. God, when I'm asking you to fulfill this promise, is that part of the big picture? Or is it just a personal need, a selfish need? I'm going to let you know, God is not going to bring you any promise that you perceive that you you should receive if it's just going to bring you an economic help or a, a little materialistic help. God, you promised that you prosper me so I can have a Mercedes-Benz car. No, it's not going to work. It's not like that. You see what I'm saying? It's about God. Is it my life going to be able to be used so other people can learn about you? God, are you going to prosper in our family in such a way that we can live and we can be able to help others? That's are the promises that he will fulfill. So we need to think, God brings promises, but think in the big picture. Step back. Whatever you're asking to God to fulfill, are you asking that based on what kind of need and on what kind of purpose? Is it the big picture? The second thing that is important, I love this psalm, and it almost has become the psalm of the Genesis book. Psalm 121, 7 and 8 says, The Lord keeps you from all harm, and what does he do? watches over your life the lord keeps watch over as you came and go both now and forever that's the second thing that we need to remember the lord watches over us i love the word watch in hebrew here because what it means it means like a hedge of thorns in that time they couldn't do fences wood was not that available or easy to work with So the only way they could protect the animals that they had from outside, for them to get out and get in danger, or animals outside to come, is to build, to create that hedge of thorns around them. So through that, they were protected from anything that will try to come and and hurt them. So what God is telling us is that he's putting that hedge of thorns surrounding us to protect us from anything that could come and hurt us. We can take the bad decision of stepping out of that hedge And then it's in our responsibility that we are exposing ourselves to be hurt. But the promise from God is that he's putting that hedge over us. Isn't that a great blessing? I confess to you that as a mother, this is a great blessing for me to know. It's not something that I need to keep reminding God to do. God knows it. God is doing that as a fact because he is God. He's going to put that protection Now, does that mean that my children, my family won't be exposed to problems? No, that's not what it means. Look at Joseph. We will be exposed to those different things. But with that, God will be able to protect us so our life and our spirit will be able to grow within that situation. But we can say, God, thank you because of that hedge of thorns that you have put that surrounds my life and protects me from places of pain and protects me from danger. And then the last thing, and this is really powerful for me. The last words that we hear Joseph saying is this. You intended to harm me. He's saying that to his brothers. But God intended it all for good. 
You see, Joseph is teaching us something very hard. When we have been hurt by people, we expect that person to come and ask for forgi to forgive us or to say, forgive me for this, don't we? Joseph is teaching us something very hard. He's providing the forgiveness before they ask. He's taking the initiative for forgiveness before they ask. That's very hard. But that's what Jesus does too. He's the one coming here to be able to bring that relationship back with us, even though he's not the one who has hurt us. We have been the ones who have walked away. But this is a powerful teaching that just can happen with that connection with God. But what I value about this is that word intended. Intended, actually, in the original, means something like weave or plate. You know what I'm talking about? I'm going to show you this, that one of the members of here, she gave it to me. And I, I like it a lot. It's this purse. Rebecca made it. Right, Rebecca? This purse is very special because, as you can see, these are just pieces of cloth, right, that were uh, from different pieces of cloth that she has. And what you can see is, is made with different, uh, how can I say this, just uh, br uh, braids. But you see, they could have been, whenever you saw them the first time, you could think, well, this is trash. I mean, you know, this is one kind, this is a different kind. But what Rebecca saw is more than that. What she saw is like, you know, if we put them together and then we, we just braid them, you can create this beautiful purse. And through this, we can, you see, this has bring a lot of happiness on my daughter because she stole it from me. And now she puts all her beanie boobs inside and she likes it because she has a lot of colors. You know, that word intended means that. Intended is that the evil Satan sometimes comes and he tries to trash our lives. And he tries to pull out from our lives joy, happiness, fulfillment. He tries to pull so we can fall in addictions and sin. He tries to pull to destroy who we are and distract us from the beautiful creation that we are. And there are times when you and I feel like these pieces of cloth, not making sense by ourselves, not finding a meaning in life. But you see what's beautiful is that the almighty, powerful God who died on the cross for us brings together all of those pieces of thread and all of these beautiful pieces of cloth and he doesn't see that each of them are different and they are useless. What he does is he sees them and he starts making this beautiful braid of story. He's using all of that to bring something good from it and brings us and gives us a new story. Perhaps when you were studying your life, you were thinking your life was gonna be used in one way or you needed to have everything perfect to be able to be used by the Lord and to have a meaning. But what God does is he puts together all of these pieces and he brings you to have a new meaning, a new life, a new way to glorify God. My brothers and sisters, what's beautiful in this place is that we all have those pieces hanging out in our lives we have those stories when we have been in the pit and we have seen the end sometimes of our lives in there. But what God does is he brings them together and makes us strong and makes us capable to step out again and say, God, that was hard. I learned. I'm not going to go back again. And then God allowed us to have a story with his story and use us so other people can find hope. So the, the meaning today, the invitation today for you is bring those pieces of cloth of you, even those that even smell dirty, bring them to the foot of the cross 
and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to this beautiful breathing with them, wave them in a way that you can see the beautiful creation that the Lord has done in you and through you. Amen.